Chapter 4, The Landfill Edgar kept the dry pass in his workyard behind the cottage. Over the years flat rocks had been placed along the major routes. Gravel and broken rocks had been pounded into the soil of most of the rest of the space. A few puddles reflected sky in the lower-lying areas. All of the stacks of materials recovered from the landfill sat raised from the ground on wooden pallets. He cast around looking for signs of his nocturnal visitor. Starting at the gate leading down to the town through the forest, he worked his way back to the stack of ceramic water pipe sections. He searched in vain, but at the stack he could see clearly that at least a dozen pipes were missing. You cheeky beggar. Must have been here three, maybe four times since I last checked this stack. He pulled the tarpaulin down over the remaining pipes and bent down to cinch it tight at the corner. A gleam caught his eye between two pipes. He reached into the space and pulled out three small gold coins. They were simply made, rough circles struck with a hammer, between two dies. Even since the fall of technology, modern coin was far more sophisticated than these crude pieces. He grinned. See, not so mad after all, you old fool. Edgar took a jeweler's loop from his pocket and examined the coins more closely. Two were clearly Roman. Edgar recognized the exaggerated nose and chin of Emperor Tiberius. Hello, Emperor Punch. The last was a mystery to him. Runic letters around a sheaf of wheat on one side and waves and a trident on the other. He hefted their weight. Well, that's more fair price for the pipes, I guess. He took the coins into his house and locked them away. At the last moment, he kept a mysterious coin and put it into the small leather bag kept inside his shirt. Something about mixing fey gold with his small hoard made him uneasy. You're a superstitious old bugger. Get a grip, or soon you'll be saying hymns and praying for your daily bread like the townsfolk. He remembered the preacher's demand for lamp oil and heating spirits. He grimaced. He'd have to abandon the area, where he had been finding some interesting artefacts and look for another place to dig down until he found a useful pool of fat and grease. He cursed under his breath. Oil rendering may be good reliable income, but it was back-breaking, boring work. He'd been quite happy to put that off for as long as possible. He checked his stock of clean rendered fat. He had enough for his regular customers for the next month, but that was a fraction of what would be needed for the preacher's tithe. He walked out on the path that climbed the gully in the domed hill behind his home, heading deeper into the maze of old excavations dug into the landfill. A bridge crossed a storm drain that fed into the mill pond beside Edgar's home. The heavy rains of the night had filled the drain with a turbulent, slightly noxious torrent. Edgar minded himself not to draw any water from the pond until it had been flushed with clean spring water. The landfill had been abandoned perhaps a hundred years ago, before the start of the long war. Henge knew that it was originally capped with a layer of low-quality clay that varied from two to six feet thick, largely smoothing out the rough surface of the heap of refuse below. It had taken a long time for plants to grow on the inhospitable clay, but little by little hardy thorn bushes had broken through the clay with deep woody roots. Atchi grass had followed, trapping organic matter and forming the first nutritious soil. Now the clay cap was a green dome, sparsely wooded with silver birch. Hench made his way deeper into the valleys dug by his family. On either side the waste of generations towered above him. Two hundred years of unwanted things laid down and covered over. Layer after layer, the geology of human history. A crow wheeled overhead as Hench surveyed his workplace. He was down below the strata that held the first crude plastics. For a full sixty feet above him the landfill was filled with plastic, layer after layer of black bags and white bags, compressed and deflated. A motley amorphous mass interspersed with a structured strata of construction waste and industrial discards. The treasures that he sought were cocooned and swaddled in plastic bags, cushioned in disintegrating plastic foam and bound with plastic cables and rope. Then there was a distinct line, a layer of carbon and ash from a long-forgotten conflagration. Above that, the dump contained glass bottles, ceramics, broken machines, everything that humanity had always discarded but the bulk of plastic had gone. Only very rarely would he find the last of the remaining plastic utensils and containers, old, yellowed, time-worn and cracked, as if they had suddenly become precious, held onto for as long as possible. The intersection of five valleys formed an open area that contained a few rough work sheds. 
Around the sheds were stacks of tools, boxes, and bottles of all sizes. The newest of the valleys ended thirty feet above the clearing. A thread of silty water ran down from it into a dark pool. Edgar went into the shed and studied a map on the wall. A grid of pins showed the places where his ancestors had taken core samples across the entirety of the pit. The colour of the pin indicated the most valuable resource found at each point, and a small hind tag gave the depth of the find. Edgar looked for the yellow pins that marked fat, oil, or grease deposits, looking for those that were closest to the existing excavations and nearest the surface or current dig depth. It's a shame that when the good Lord gave the preacher that word of wisdom, he didn't include some kind of clue where I should be digging. That would have been wise and useful. Edgar closed his eyes and hovered his finger over the centre of the map. He imagined he felt a tingling in the tip of his finger and moved it in the direction that made the tingle grow into a buzz. He opened his eyes. His finger hovered over a red pin. Ferris metal. Come on, that's no blinking good to me. He started to pull his hand away and saw the white pin that had been hidden. Ham Fatberg Damp. That could be a gold mine of useful grease. Fatbergs formed in the sewers when people were concentrated into cities. Used oil and grease from cooking was washed into the drainage system from homes and restaurants. It cooled and congealed, tumbling through the sewer system until the flow could no longer push it along or it stuck to another lump of fat that had already bound itself to a sewage pipe. All manner of discarded sanitary items and effluent was caught by the growing mass of grease, which grew organically until it completely closed that branch of the system. Fatbergs of a hundred tons or more, and a couple of hundred metres in length had been found, and each had to be painstakingly dug out and taken away for disposal. It was possible that one such berg had been dumped in Hinge's landfill not too far from where he had been digging at the end of the nearest valley. Henge grinned. He was in for an unpleasant couple of days digging, and he knew that he would be separating out the worst kind of contaminants, but the thought of the preacher heating and lighting the abbey with the product of the world's biggest shitberg filled him with a warm glow of satisfaction. Edgar had decided to dig into the wall of the valley that he had lately been working. It was technically more challenging than digging down from the top in the location indicated by the map, but he calculated that he would have to move far less material to reach the fat deposit. If the deposit did prove to be a fat burk, the spread could be quite large, and he may not have far to dig at all. It was the smell that first told him that his guess was correct. Even Edgar's dull scent picked up on waves of odour wafting through the spaces, between the accumulation of crushed boxes, amorphous conglomerations of decomposition, wickedly sharp shards and ribbons of metal. The smell brought back a memory. He had happened across the bloated body of a cow when he was a child, its legs splayed white by the swelling of the gas trapped in its belly. His friend had dared him to prod the cow with a stick. Dare you. Double dare you. Chicken. Buck, buck, buck. You do it, if you're so brave. Can't. You've been dared. Can't do it unless you say you're a weedy chicken. Grim-faced, Edgar had pulled his jersey up over his nose and approached the cow. The stick stopped dead at the rigid height of the cow. His friend jeered him, told him to push harder. Edgar leaned on the stick and fell forward when it sunk completely into the cow. The skin split and black fluid exploded over Edgar's arm, head and torso. His friend threw up and ran leaving Edgar alone with the stench. He remembered that smell, and how many times he had had to wash himself before the taint left him. The smell from this fat burg wasn't that bad. Not quite. He looked up at the weight of refuse above him. Time to put in another support. Outside the dig he had left a dozen of the devices his father had invented. A sturdy crossbeam to hold the weight of the rubbish above a tunnel, fold out legs to brace it, and a wretched system to raise the beam to take the weight. Planks laid in grooves in the top of the crossbeam supported the rough tunnel's roof. Hinge didn't have the impressive stature of Trader Josh and his hulking family. However, years of digging through the pits and pulling heavy finds out had given him prodigious hidden strength. Even wearing his thick leather jerkin, armoured gauntlets and steel-soled boots would have exhausted most of the village folk in short order. He put his shoulder under the sagging tunnel roof and straightened his legs with a grunt. The mass above him compressed and lifted six inches, then a further three inches to give him room to force the crossbeam into place. 
A few heavy blows with a sledgehammer set the roof boards, then alternating from side to side he ratcheted up the archway to give himself a further two feet of headroom. As the ceiling lifted, Edgar became aware of a sudden change in the gloom to his left. Some wide piece of debris above the beam had released a trapped support. There was a small trust light into the tunnel around Edgar's feet, and the sound of things falling into the darkness. Hench pinned the new support into place. He fetched the lantern from its hook on the previous support. He could feel the difference in the air before the lamp revealed the opening. Stale air sighed out of a large hidden space as a narrow gap opened up in the wall. Cautiously, Edgar widened the access, reaching in with an arm-long wooden handle to hook and pull in lumps of compressed and congealed cardboard towards him. When the opening was wide enough for him to enter, he raised the lantern and looked in without leaving the safety of the prop supported tunnel. He could make out a canted metal lined space. It appeared to be a dollar shipping container. The container sloped down away from him, and the whole container was tilted about twenty degrees to Hinge's right. Benches bolted to the left wall were raised above him, drawers hanging out over the debris strewn floor space. With every fibre Hinge wanted to climb into the container. Instead, he methodically hooked the loose material from the floor of the tunnel and pulled it outside, tossing it aside onto his spoil heap. When he was satisfied with the clear tunnel, he sat outside in the weak sun, took off his metal and leather gauntlets and chewed in a wad of calming herb. Five minutes went past. He had heard a few small creaks from the settling starter of refuse in the tunnel, but nothing that concerned him. He stood, stretched the aches out of his body and entered the tunnel. The opening leading to the shipping container was clear, the material around it unchanged since he had left the tunnel. He tied a rope around an old wooden pallet embedded in the far wall, and stepped across into the container. He hooked the lantern to the edge of one of the benches, and tied the end of the rope to a column that had been welded into place in the centre of the container. This would be his guide if a trash slide fell into the opening, blocking his exit. He threw out the loose scattering of garbage that had fallen in from the tunnel wall excited to uncover the contents of the container. Everything had fallen against the right side. He could see tall lockers on the wall, blocked by musty cardboard boxes that had fallen against them. The boxes in their turn were covered in items that had fallen from the benches. Henge's heart beat heavily in his chest. Contraband. The whole container was filled with forbidden items. His hand trembled as he carefully moved ancient power supplies, meters, and a precious, seemingly intact oscilloscope. Many of the things he had seen only in the fragile paper catalogues and hobby electronics magazines that he and his father had kept hidden, studying with an intense curiosity, a private obsession. Even the debris from the benches was treasure, reels of solder, screws, cable ties, several soldering irons, wire cutters, pliers, a myriad small tools. But Henge had one objective. He had to open one of the lockers. His gut told him his life was about to change, his breath was quick and shallow. Time crawled as he carefully moved the heavy boxes blocking the first locker. Finally, it was free. He pulled the door open and found two mildewed white lab coats hanging in front of a large panel of circuit breakers. Disappointed, he sat on one of the boxes, leaning back against the next locker in line. After a while, he laughed. Well, what are you mopping for? You're all fool. The find of a lifetime this is. What more do you want? Unicorns farting rainbows. He went to pull himself up, grabbing the corner of a box to steady himself. The ancient dry cardboard parted suddenly, and he found himself sitting down again with a jolt, a lump of cardboard in his hand. He glanced at the box, then jumped up and grabbed the lantern. Holding it close to the box, he saw a black metal hand and a dark grey heavily enamelled wrist. Spare parts. Hours of opening boxes and lockers had failed to uncover the one thing that Edgar had dared to hope for, a fully assembled robot, ready to recharge and activate. He wasn't sure exactly why that was something he thought would be good to have. Since he was a child, he had shivered at tales of the carnage a single device had wrought when it broke through the barricades around the village and stormed through the centre. After almost sixty years, there was still clear evidence of fingertip gouges on a stone column inside the abbey. Whenever a villager, whether they be youth, citizen, or old folk showed an unnatural interest in creating or possessing some device beyond the technology allowed by the law, 
the law keepers would bring them to the abbey. There, they would kneel on gravel, one hand raised uncomfortably high and placed on the finger gouges of the column. The verger would recite the list of permitted devices, their origins and benefits to society. Then the preacher would preach a fiery sermon castigating the penitent for embracing the wickedness of the past. They were accused of inviting demons back into the world to plague humanity once more. When the penitent's arm and back were taut with pain, their legs on fire, knees singing with agony from the pressure of gravel, the preacher would exhort them to repent. 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 Finishing with a blessing and the command to go forth and sin no more. Edgar had suffered through that ordeal three times. The next time he would have been flogged, and probably with a flail, not a birch like the young aristocrat in the market square. He had learnt to hide his fascination with the things of the past, to keep to himself his ideas for easing the toil and drudgery of the virtuous, but dull villagers. A drop of rain hit his forehead with a flat splat. Edgar came back to the present with a start, looking around and seeing big round spots start to appear on the ground. His hands were on the box of parts that he had assembled from the collection in the bear chipping container. He hefted it onto the flat bed cart that he had pulled up the valley from his workshop. The return journey was bumpy and the path uneven, so he pushed the box tight to the cart's end railing and tied it down. He had to pull one more item from the container. Henge had installed another tunnel support, forming a junction in the tunnel and securing the entrance to a container. As he approached the junction the stench of ancient orchard in rancid fat assailed him again, reminding him that he had only a little time available to dig through and shovel the stinking grease into a dozen barrels. The rendering and purification was going to take almost all the time remaining before the verger would come for the preacher's tithe gift. He shrugged. It was near the end of the day. Tomorrow was soon enough to resume digging to the fatberg. In the container Edgar checked the rope that he had knotted around the heavy gunmetal grey barrel. The barrel was still capped with the original thick black covers at each end that had been strapped in place in the factory. Edgar had wrapped it in thick protective plastic sheet and formed loops of rope around the barrel. It was dressed up like a Sunday roast. Satisfied, he returned to the tunnel, braced his feet against the edge of a buried section of brickwork and pulled. The barrel toppled over. Hinda's shoulders burned with the strain of fighting against the weight trying to roll to the back of the container, but with a grunt he started to pull the rope hand over hand towards him. It fell off of the lip of the container, and Edgar had to redouble his effort to raise it up to the level of the main tunnel. Before he left the dig site, Edgar pulled some rough sheets of plywood and debris across the side tunnel, hiding the container. The big wheeled cart made light work of the return to Edgar's base camp and the workshop. The heavy load made him glad of the brakes he had fitted to the ancient cart. In his father's time, they had to lower the cart down the steeper slopes using a rope and capstan to belay its descent. Riding the cart down the slope while hauling on the twin brake levers to steer and slow himself may have been hair-raising, but it saved much time and effort. As the day faded and the moon rose, Edgar placed the barrel on his workbench with tubular parts arranged roughly around. He was looking at a disarticulated skeleton. Each bone was a single metallic grey enamelled metal piston. There were too many elbows and knee joints. This robot was human-like, but would move in an unnerving and human way. Each joint was a knobbly black assembly ready to link bone to bone, and bone to body. The head was not what he had expected. It had a blank flat space where he had looked for a face. From the bottom of the parts box, he pulled out the assembly instructions he'd found in the container. The front cover had a detailed drawing of the assembled device. He held it closer to the lantern and saw that the completed robot was indeed featureless and blank-faced. In the picture it was carrying a heavy-looking box up some stairs, watched by a beaming clean-cut man wearing a knitted armless sweater over a shirt and tie. The man was smiling around the pipe clamped in his mouth. A boy with crew-cut hair capered and clapped. A young girl held a dolly and watched on in Cupid bow-lipped wonder. Hen shook his head, smiling at the archaic drawing. He stretched, cracking the joints of his back. The digging and hauling of boxes had taken its toll, and his empty stomach was giving him insistent reminders that he should be looking after his own body, rather more urgently than the metal one laid out on his bench. In the morning, he'd open the millpond sluice and start a small generator, 
charge in the workshop's power stones ready for work on the robot. He trudged down the slope to his home, studiously ignoring the fleeting glimpses of red in the middle distance to either side of the path, and the hunched shapes under trees that were boulders. Yes, definitely boulders in the leaf-dappled moonlight. He'd passed them a thousand times, 